Okay, we're going to go over how to solve a Newton's second law problem. First, we're just going to outline a procedure that we can use for solving these kinds of problems. I'm going to use this procedure for every Newton's second law problem that we do throughout the year. We're always going to start first by identifying all the forces acting on all the objects in the problem. In other words, drawing what is known as a free body diagram, which I will abbreviate as an FBD. We'll do that by listing the forces that we're going to consider. And at this point, we're only going to be considering five different forces. So this is a checklist you might just have with you whenever you're doing a Newton's second law problem. And just identify the weights of all the objects, any normal forces between any surfaces that are in contact, the tension from any ropes that are attached to any objects, the friction between any surfaces, and then ask the question, should I be worrying about air resistance? Identify all of those forces. The next thing we need to do is describe the motion in an inertial frame of reference. Explicitly identify that frame of reference. That will be important first to make sure we're measuring our accelerations relative to the something that is not accelerating so that we can use Newton's second law. Newton's second law only works in inertial frames of reference. Sometimes we'll have frames of reference that will be accelerating. If you're in a car that's accelerating, you should not be describing motions relative to the car. Secondly, it will give us our sign convention. So explicitly say, I'm going to consider up to be positive. Because you can make down to be positive, so long as you're consistent. So identify your plus and minus signs. Then what we're going to do is take and apply F equals MA to write down what are known as the equations of motion for each object in the problem. And with this just right here, the sum of all the forces just comes straight off the free body diagram. That equals the mass of each object times the acceleration of that object. Do that for all of the objects. This will get us a set of equations. However, in addition, generally speaking, there'll be some constraints on the problem, often due to surfaces or ropes. Surfaces will force objects to move in a given direction, and tensions on ropes may constrain two objects to move together. In addition, we'll have force laws, for an example, for friction and things like air resistance. So I'll write down those equations. This will, in general, give us a set of mathematical equations, generally a set of simultaneous equations to be solved. Our objective is to write down a set of n equations for our n unknowns in the problem. We then have an algebra problem, and we do the math. I'll show how to do this using a very classic problem, namely one called an Atwood's machine. An Atwood's machine is simply two masses attached uh, to ends of a string over a pulley. We will assume that the string is very light, so we don't need to worry about the mass of the string. We're also going to assume the string is rigid and will not stretch or change its length. We're also going to assume the pulley is frictionless on its, its axle right here and is very light, so it has a mass that's very, very small compared to these two masses. So the only masses we need to worry about are these two blocks. Now, if the two masses are equal, nothing interesting will happen, and they'll just stay at rest. So we're going to make one mass heavier than the other. Just to be consistent for this problem, I'm going to consider M2 to be the heavier of the two mass, simply because in this diagram it is larger. So we'll take M2 to be larger than M1. We also will start our system at rest. What we wish to find are the accelerations of these two masses and the tensions on both sides of the rope. That's our problem. So we're going to use our procedure to solve this problem. So step number one is to draw a free body diagram for all of the, the masses. In this case, we do not need to worry about the pulley. The pulley has no mass. We just need to identify the forces acting on block number one and block number two. So take a moment, draw the free body diagram, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's draw the free body diagram. So let's start with weight. So let's identify the weights of each of the objects. And notice we're going to label them differently because they're not the same value. So this we will call M1G equal the weight of the first object, and this will be M2G equal the weight of the second one. Don't label them the same because they're not. Normal forces we do not need to worry about. Nothing is sitting on a surface. There are no normal forces involved. And because nothing is rubbing against each other, we have no friction. We're also told 
The pulley itself has no friction, so we don't need to worry about normal forces. We do not need to worry about friction. The next force on our list is tension. Well, there's a rope on each one of the masses, so there's a tension on mass number one and there's tension on mass number two. They will always be along the length of the rope and, in this case, up, and both of them are up. Our last force is air resistance, and we're going to assume our vo velocities here will be fairly small. They're starting at rest. These are two objects attached to each other. They're not going to be falling at anywhere near their terminal velocity. Air resistance will be considered negligible. Not only that, in order to include air resistance, which we will later, we need to know something about the size of the object. That's something about its drag coefficient. We weren't given that information, so we cannot include air resistance. So there we are. There is our free body diagram identifying all of the forces acting on both objects. Next, we need to pick our inertial frame of reference. Note, the frame of reference must be inertial. We have to avoid uh, the so-called fictitious forces because they're fictitious. We don't want to make things up. Generally speaking, we'll want to align our axes so they'll be in the direction that one or both objects will be moving in. That will basically just simplify the math. You can pick your directions any way you want. But since this object's going to be moving up and down and this object's going to be moving up and down, it would make sense to put our axes up and down. This also will define our plus and minus sign convention. So this will be our axes. We'll put y being vertical and up will be positive, down will be negative, put our x-axis horizontal. Turns out the x-axis is going to be irrelevant because nothing's moving horizontally. One key thing is we could technically describe each one of these motions for the two objects using a different frame of reference. Here, we're not, because they're both moving up and down. Now that we have our frame of reference, we're now set to apply Newton's second law. Newton's second law is a vector equation. This is a vector sum equals a scalar times a vector. One way to consider that is what we're really saying is that the left-hand side of this equation must equal the right-hand side of the equation using both components. So the x component of the net force must equal the mass times the x component of the acceleration. And the same for the y component. So this is really two equations in one. Technically it's three, but we're not going to worry about the z direction. So for each mass, we're going to write down the sum of the forces acting in the x direction, and that'll equal the mass of that object times the acceleration of that object in the x direction, and then do the same for the y. In this particular problem, there are no forces acting in the x direction. So the net force in the x direction is zero, which tells me the acceleration in that direction must be zero. For the y direction, we're just going to read it straight off the free body diagram using our sign convention that we picked for our frame of reference. So the tension right here is up, that's positive, so it's T1 minus, because gravity is acting in the downward direction, times M1g, and that equals the mass of this object times its acceleration. It is important to put down the subscript right here to say that this is the mass of block number one, and this is A sub one, because that's the acceleration of this object. It is not a generic acceleration. It's the acceleration of one and only one object. And we do the exact same thing for the second mass, and we get a very similar result. No forces in the x direction, and again, tension minus weight equals mass times acceleration. These are two different masses, and these are two different accelerations. Now that we have our equations of motion, we note we only really have two equations here. And we have four unknowns. We have two tensions and two accelerations. That is not a mathematically determined system, so we need two more equations. So what we're going to do is consider the constraints on the problem. First, we have a light string. The string will not change its length. That means when this object right here moves up a certain distance, this object must move down the same distance in the same amount of time. That means that the velocity of one must be equal and opposite to the velocity of the other. These two must move together. Because of that, we can take the derivative of both sides of the equation and find out that their accelerations must also be equal and opposite. It's the only way to keep the string from stretching. Now, just to simplify the matter, we don't need to write these subscripts. 
we're just going to call A1A, which makes A2 minus A. So these two accelerations will be equal and opposite. Now we can consider the tensions. This pulley we've defined to be essentially nothing. It has no mass. It applies no forces. So really, there's nothing between this end of the string and that end of the string. We already discovered when you have a string and you're pulling on both ends, you must have the same tension on either end. So this tells me, by Newton's third law, that T1 must equal T2. But that is only true because what's in between them is a massless, frictionless pulley that takes no effort to move. The only thing this tension does, this pulley does, is change the direction of the tension. It doesn't change the value of the tension. So the tension on one end of the string must equal the tension on the other end of the string. So T1 equals T2. Subscripts are irrelevant, so I'm just going to call the tension T. So now we can collect our equations together. We have this equation from Newton's second law, this equation from Newton's second law. This equation comes from the string not stretching. This equation comes from the pulley being massless and frictionless. So now we can take and eliminate these T2s and simply call them T1 and T2 and simply call them T and replace these accelerations, one with just A and the other with minus A. This now gives us two equations for our two unknowns, the tension and the acceleration. Take a moment and solve those two equations and then we'll go over the final answer. Okay, in order to get the acceleration, one way to do it is just take the two equations and subtract them. That will cancel out the tension. It'll give us this equation, where our only unknown will be the acceleration. We solve that. We get the acceleration is the difference in the two masses divided by the sum of the two masses times g. Our tension we can get by just taking this expression and substituting it into either of those two equations and solve for t. And this is the expression we get. t is 2 times m1 plus m2 divided by m1 plus m2 times g. And that's our final answer. Finally, what we want to do is consider, did we get the answer correct? Or is it at least plausible? First thing we should consider, do our expressions have the correct units? Acceleration will have the units of meters per second squared. Here I've got masses, but it's basically masses divided by masses. The kilograms will cancel out. And the acceleration has the same units of g. Well, g is acceleration, so a has the correct units. It'll have the units of g. It'll have the units of meters per second squared. T is the product of two masses, so that's kilograms squared divided by kilograms plus kilograms. So one of the kilograms will cancel out. Tension will have the units of mass times acceleration, but that's a force. Kilograms times meters per second squared is newtons. So both of these at least have the correct units. Now we can consider some extreme cases. What happens if the two masses are equal? Then the acceleration should be zero, and the tension should just equal the weight. So if the two masses are equal, this cancels out to be zero. This is just 2m, so this will just be zero. If these two masses are equal, we've got m squared divided by 2m. The, two, the twos cancel out. And one of the m's cancel out, the tension is just mg, exactly as we want. Now, consider a second extreme case. This makes m2 not just bigger than m2, but much, much, much bigger than m1. m2 is extremely massive. If m2 is extremely massive, m2 should essentially be in free fall. And that means the tension should essentially be zero. So let's see what happens. Well, if m2 is very, very big, subtracting a small number is not going to change it by much. Adding a small number is not going to change it by much. These two m1s will be negligibly small. So essentially, we have m2 divided by m2, which is 1. Acceleration is essentially g. If the two, m2 is very, very big, essentially adding this will be nothing. m2s will cancel out, and the tension will just be 2 m1, which is really small, times g. So the tension will be really small. As we expect, the tension goes to zero. The heavier mass, which is minus A, so the heavier mass will be essentially in free fall at minus G. So that checks out. So our answer is at least plausible.